Welcome to your weekly program, Blahdan, the show that brings the other side of Muslim American to your living room. I know through history and how we look at history is really very different and it's fascinating for me at least to see how you bring historical figures to modern life and look at them from a modern uh, criteria and things. And I, I think uh, the idea of bringing Jesus, which is a revered uh, uh, figure historically, uh, and try to look at what happened to him. It's been happen, you know, happened before in movies and literature, and people brought him to, uh, you know, make fun of him, brought him as a, as a, as a hippie. Uh, the Republican conservative brought him as a strong CEO for the rich and famous, not for the poor. And uh, under the American ink, Jesus is the CEO. This is the new Protestant ethos. But here is another way to look at uh, uh, at, uh, at Jesus, and we, this is really you know, fascinating. And we have here Mark uh, Osler. He is a professor of law at uh, University of St. Thomas Law School, and he also uh, was a federal, federal prosecutor. He is an expert on federal sentence guidance who has appeared on P, uh, NB, NPR, Morning Edition, ABC, a lot of uh, our national network. And he wrote a book, a new book called Jesus on Death Row. It's a very fascinating book. I mean, I, uh, the, the title really uh, got me, oh, I got to see this, uh, and, uh, you know, everybody. And from a Muslim uh, persuasion, you know, we, uh, as you know, Muslims uh, do not believe that uh, uh, Jesus was uh, crucified. So the capital punishment uh, of Jesus is not really resonates uh, in the Muslims' uh, 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 psychological uh, landscape. Uh, so I really, I, I was intrigued by this book, and I want to know more about it. But the, the idea of the book is comparing, uh, uh, you know, the capital punishment here in America, especially what's happening in Texas, which uh, our guest, uh, you know, worked there for, for, for years. Uh, how you compare what happened to uh, a trial of Jesus during that, uh, that time and bring it to modern life to how we uh, handle uh, capital punishment. And, and, uh, and based on this book, there's a lot of similarity of the procedures, uh, the accusation, the informants, and all those things. It's really find, uh, interesting to find out how uh, uh, Professor uh, Osler came to that, uh, to that uh, idea. Welcome to Bulahdan. And I know it's a long introduction, but I want to give you a background. But this is fascinating, uh, uh, you know, premises. And, and I said before, uh, a lot of people will bring the past and measure it with, with modern uh, values or modern criteria, mm -hmm. and, and it's not a fair uh, comparison in, in a way, you know. They were, you know, they always uh, compare the, uh, the best with, uh, with the worst, and how, how the East and West compare their history and all that. So, but in, in your premises, it's almost you are bringing the present and comparing to the past, you know, you're making a judgment about how we handle capital punishment. Am I, am I correct? Am yeah, I right? Yeah. This is very fast. Yeah. It's almost the reverse what most people do. Mm -hmm. uh, how how you, you really try to make an, a qualitative and quantitative judgment about capital punishment now in the United States and compare it to what happened to Jesus, uh, you know, uh, 50,000, I mean, what, I mean, 2,000, more than 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Tell us about how, how, how the idea got a grip <laughs> in your mind and how you convince yourself I could write a book about this. Yeah, it's, it's, it has to do with moving to Texas. <laughs> uh, in the year 2000, I've been living in Detroit where I'm from. That's where I was a federal prosecutor. And in 2000, I got a job at Baylor University uh, teaching law, moved down there, and it was an election season. Um, you know, that was the, the, the Bush-Gore election, oh in fact. And it was shocking to me how Christianized the political culture was in Texas. That there, uh, every ad for a politician had some stock photos that had to be a part of it. The guy on a horse. And that's legal? Um, I mean, I see what you mean. Yeah. Stock, not, not uh, religious. Uh. Well, actually, part of it was. I mean, it's very common there to have a political ad show the person walking out of church with his family, for mm. example. Um, many of the political discussions about things were rooted in the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a Christianized political culture. I see. And it really struck me as odd that at the center of this Christianized political culture, you had such fervent support for the death penalty, given that the faith at its center had an unjust execution. Um, that, that's, uh, yeah, and I read that uh, in the book, and that's, 
this kind of uh, paradox that uh, how people settle it in, in their in their culture in their mind this is not a con that's not a contradiction yeah i i think that people tend to think about law and order issues separate from their faith um, you know one thing that i find is from people who read the book or you know now we've gone on this project of doing the trial live mm -hmm. in various places a few weeks ago we did it in austin texas and the reaction to that, more than anything else that we get, is that people hadn't thought of it that way. They hadn't thought of how they view the death penalty in the context of their faith. Um, other than, you know, perhaps... Well, don't, you know, yeah. it's a punishment. Mm -hmm. But because uh, what, what was strike me, the, the punishment of, of Jesus was, was almost like uh, what, they, what we call him uh, uh, victim of conscience. Mm -hmm. You know, it was ideas that they were persecuted, not not right. the person. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you, your examples were people. The, 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 you know, our mother life, they commit, they allegedly commit crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a difference between how you, how you persecute an idea as opposed to how you persecute an individual behavior? Yeah. That, well, how, how the similar was that? And, of course, when we're talking about, about sentencing, Process. we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about... The, you know, the sentencing part, what we're prosecuting is danger. Oh. You know, how dangerous is this person going forward? How long do we have to incapacitate him for? Oh. Um, you know, for example, the, the Boston Marathon bombing. Yeah. Um, if that person is caught who did that, or those people who caught are, 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 you know, who did it, one of the things that people will talk about is they might do it again. You know, this could happen again. They have to be incapacitated for a long time. Um, and that, that in the legal interpretation, Yes. In the sentence. Yes. And in fact, in Texas, when a jury is considering whether or not to uh, have someone executed, the principal issue that's put before them, the question on the verdict form, is does this person uh, uh, present the probability of future dangerousness? And so that idea of is this murder dangerous that we see now in contemporary death penalty proceedings was very much like what they were thinking about with Jesus. Even though what he presented was, was threats that were mostly idea threats, he was perceived, I see what you mean. perceived as a danger to the religious and, heart. And, and you cannot separate that from the culture, you know, like yep. uh, uh, I'm sure the statistics say uh, blacks are four or five times be, mm -hmm. uh, have a, to receive a capital punishment than whites. It's disproportionate. Disproportionate. Yeah. I mean, the number may change here and there. So how, uh, uh, as a former prosecutor, how do you separate culture from uh, the legal? You know, I, I was at the, the terror trial, which was mm -hmm. uh, in the yeah. summer, about the Somali uh, Shabab, you know. And I was fascinated, uh, not fascinated, I really was uh, disturbed by the questioning of the lawyer. Because mm -hmm. most of the questions were culture questions. Yeah. They were not legal questions. Like, you know, do you read, the, when you read the Quran, do you read the, the terror verses? Mm -hmm. I've never heard something as a terror versus. But those uh, nine white uh, juries, uh, you know, terror versus terror versus. Yeah. You know, every time That's you... That's what they imagine. Exactly, there. exactly. Yeah. Every time you meet, you pray. I mean, there is five, only five prayers in, uh, in a day. You know, you don't... Mm -hmm. You know, if the time for prayer, you pray. I mean, it was intentionally misguiding or misinforming uh, the jury. So... Uh, how you manipulate, you know, uh, you know, those 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 type of cultural issues during trial? Yeah, I mean, you can't separate culture, the culture of a place, from criminal law. It's always going to be there, and so the the, the thing to stop it from being manipulated for wrongful purposes, for for uh, focusing on someone because of their ethnicity, because of their religion, because of their race is that you have to constantly be conscious of that. Mm. Uh, and the incentives very often are the opposite way. Um, you know, that it's, yeah. uh, if you talk to African Americans, there's, there's a strong consciousness of being picked on by criminal processes. Mm -hmm. And they're right. They're right about that. <laughs> the statistic. Uh, it's not, right, it's not mistaken. Um, and that is, does that draw from the broader culture? Of course it does. Um, you know, the same way that people are going to be targeted for examination in terrorism. I mean, already, for example, with the Boston people Marathon. People assume things. We, there's, yeah. there's no... The Saudi, and the guy yeah. Saudi is uh, injured, mm -hmm. a victim becomes a suspect. Right. 
does the, does the legal our legal system driven by our culture or the other way around? I mean, it seems like our our legal uh, is more progressive than our culture historically, other, opposed to other. Is this yeah. a, is this a right assumption? Well, like slavery was uh, le illegal, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. Segregation was illegal, but it's still there. In that kind of things. So our legal time time protect our earnest, our cultural earnest of some sort. It, and this may be a little too lawyerly, but, yeah. but the Constitution tends to lead on principle because the Constitution limits what government can do. Yes. It tells you what a law can't do. Okay. Whereas law, statutes, tends to respond much more directly to primal impulses in which there is prejudice and things like that embedded in the culture. Let me give you an example. Another project that I've worked on long term is the ridiculously high punishments there were for crack for, for yeah, decades in the United States. Or, or, or powder cocaine yeah, even, which led to much greater rates of incarceration for African Americans. And where did that come from? It came from a single incident within the culture primarily, which is a basketball player died um, from the University of Maryland who'd been drafted number two overall in the draft, a guy named Len Bias, by the Boston Celtics. Um, you know, and what happens is he goes to the draft, puts on the Celtics yeah, hat, yeah, yeah. dies of a cocaine overdose. Because he's black, people assume it's crack. It turns out that was probably wrong. Um, well, the Democratic leaders of the Congress at that time, Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, yeah, the two of them, they go back home to Boston. They're both from, from Massachusetts. Yeah, both and everybody's outraged because they've lost their top draft Even pick. Even coming from the liberal and Democrats, they, right. were, they were tougher on the, uh, the sentence. Right. So they pushed that bill. Ronald Reagan was happy to sign it. You had agreement on that, and it made no sense whatsoever. And so there we see the statute being driven by really just an anecdote. Yeah. Um, whereas where we see law leading and, and creating principles um, for addressing segregation um, and things like that, it's usually from the Constitution, not from statutes. Uh, uh, tell us about the similar, you have about four or five components of that mm -hmm. trial. Yeah. Take us through it. Uh, I know this is a, mo a mock trial that you had. Mm -hmm. And it, it tell us how you structure it. What are the things that you were making sure that it's there when you're making that trial? Yeah, I mean, one of the central things that, that's in the book and I was really struck by it. So I went back and read the story in the Bible, is the role of the overcommitted prosecutor. That, you know, there's a description in the Gospels of Caiaphas, who is the, you know, one of the chief priests, who served as the prosecutor. And uh, when I was a kid and I read this, I thought it was almost comic, but yeah. he gets so enraged and wrapped up about it and because his witnesses are conflicting. His witnesses aren't agreeing with one another. Uh, that he rips his shirt and says, isn't that enough for you? Execute him. And it just demands it. And that's, that's when it turns and they, they, they find for execution. And ripping the shirt in the culture, mm -hmm. it's really a, a, yeah. a significant in itself. But as a former prosecutor, that really resonated with me because what... You're supposed to do that. Well, not that you're supposed to get enraged yeah. because you're not supposed to. You're actually, you're, you're supposed yeah. to keep on an even keel. But that feeling inside when things aren't going well, and it wasn't going well. You know, see, witnesses I were saying different things. And I see. You have to remember the role we put prosecutors in, which is you have to go into court and publicly look someone in the eye and say, I want you to spend many years in prisons. Or in a case like, like we see in, in Texas often, I want you to die. That's an incredible emotional commitment that mm -hmm. that person has made. And if it's not going well... I see what you mean. Yeah. And but he, he making the judgment already. Mm. I mean, he, he had the verdict in his mind. That, he did. Yeah. And so. just the same way that as a prosecutor, if I'm oh, going I to see. prosecute a case, oh, I, I better have that level of commitment if I I'm see. going to go forward, or else I shouldn't take the case. I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So he's guilt in, <laughs> yeah. in your mind. And the same way that that plays out in the Gospels, we see overcommitted prosecutors being a big problem with death penalty law. Um, you know, you'll read stories where DNA has exonerated yeah. someone, but the prosecutor still won't dismiss the charge. And it's that same psychology that we see in the story of Jesus with Caiaphas, where he's so committed that he's, he's ripping his clothing in, in front of the, 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 the rest of the, the council. So the word, the word uh, like, uh, what's the equivalent of jury that in that trial, in the Jesus trial? Um, it was the... the public? The, no, no, it was a it was a religious council, 
really that okay. was that was seen in judgment and selected and mm -hmm. for some reason yeah uh, so uh, and then uh, you have the informant which is very fascinating yeah it's almost like it's happening now it, with this oh. uh, terrorist yeah. craze there's so many informants now mm -hmm. than even during hoover and and one of the things about i mean in in my cases we use informants all the time and one of the things that you need informants to tell you is who's doing what and where they are so you know how to go arrest them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and that's exactly what Judas did. And the other thing about Judas that's, that's so interesting is that the problem with informants in contemporary law is that their incentive is getting paid very this often. Is what, that, I did not know this. I, yeah. mean, I know, but uh, within that model, the, the, the witness, that you get them paid for what you're saying? Well, the thing about informants is they usually don't become witnesses. Oh, they provide information. They're hidden. Uh, right. They tell police the, the police things like, these guys in this house over here are, are making methamphetamine. Yeah. And then they'll get a search warrant, and the evidence will be the search warrant. Or here, they wouldn't need Judas to testify at the trial. He simply showed them where Jesus was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, another thing that plays into this that I'm sure you notice is the strategic arrest that they waited until they thought everyone was going to be asleep so that there would be less violence. Which we do it here. Which, now. exactly what we do. And in fact, that's one of the things I train my students now at St. Thomas. I have a class called criminal practice. And one of the things we talk about is strategic arrest. And the reason that you would do that for both gathering evidence and for safety of officers. And that's exactly what they did. Just very practical years. reasons. Yes. Not, not legal conscious or whatever. Yep. But, you know, are you putting the, our uh, capital punishment or our legal system on trial in a way, not comparing trials? Absolutely. And I, I, I don't apologize for that. Um, you wrote a book about it. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I'll, I go to Texas and, and, and do the trial there. One of the questions, one of the hardest questions that I get from Christians, and this is within the Christian community, um, you know, having read the Quran on this, I know that the position is very different yeah. within, within Islam on the death penalty. But within Christianity, we believe that, that God scripted the story of Jesus. And doesn't it mean something that God made the choice that Jesus would be someone wrongfully executed? Um, yeah. That, that, that's, yeah. A lot of Muslims will have issue with that. Yes, I can understand. It's a, it's a, a, a area where the, yeah. the faith is different. Yeah. But in Texas, the people you're talking to who are for the death penalty are Christians, and so uh, primarily. And so that that's is devoted why. Christian, mm -hmm. not just... Yeah, yeah. But, but how would it differ in, in, in Islam? Because in, in Islam, uh, Jesus was exonerated and mm -hmm. he was uh, saved, and the one who was executed was Judas. Yeah. So how do I work in, in, in the legal, the informant is the one who was... Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that happened. Or... I, I, I know, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to yeah. me because uh, what does that change? Yeah. Um, you know, does that mean it was right to execute Judas? Yeah. Um, you know, because... Was he creating mischief in the he, land? He, he committed a crime too. I mean, yeah, he, he, not 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 legal crime, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe culture crime. Yeah, and I was that was that deserved. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things I was I was saying is that the toughest question from Christian audiences is: Are you comparing Jesus Christ to a murderer? Um, because in a way, we are. That's who's getting the death penalty now, and we're mm -hmm. we're doing it under the the law of the state where we go. Um, and the answer is yes, obviously we are. But, but the answer to Christians to that is we do that in the invitation of Christ. Because one of the things that Christ said is when you visit those in prison, you visit me. And he didn't say when you visit those who are innocent or you no. visit the political prisoner. Those people in prison are me and how you treat them is important. And so when we make that comparison, it's really at, at Christ's invitation. And that's something that you're not going to have under the, uh, the Islamic view of those events. But it seems like Jesus himself did not believe in a, in a legal process at the time. He, he, was, mm -hmm. he was putting it at the time, even putting that trial on, because the way they questioned him, the way they yeah. answered, he would put him on trial himself, but they actually were embarrassed. Yeah. And they wanted to speed it up. Yeah, they did. And one of the things that was frustrating to them that, that echoes what we have now is that he wouldn't testify. Yeah. They kept trying to get him to say, you know, tell yeah. us if you're the, the king of the Jews. And he, oh, you he, said it. Said, so you say. And if you think about it, that's exactly how it works now, is that with the Fifth Amendment, defendants have the right just to leave the government to the proofs. Not so you say. Himself. Yeah. Fifth Amendment. Yeah. And, and it, you know, how did that idea come? You know, I know you, you elaborate, but, but is it a, a Roca moment? Or, 
So um, I can make that comparison, and it just you got up in the middle of the night and it started. No, it was, it was. I mean, there was a specific moment where I started thinking about. I, I want to look for these these things that are similar, mm. and it's. Uh, I woke up in my house in Waco, Texas, and. Um, Read, opened up the paper, and there was a story about an execution that had happened that week. It was on the front page. And then the, the start, the very lead of that was what this person had for their last meal. Cheeseburger. The last supper. Yeah. You have a section of what? Yeah. yeah. It had uh, you know, a cheeseburger, a Dr. Pepper, and a, and a cupcake. And we find that very compelling, what a prisoner chooses for their, their last, last meal. meal. Uh, and then I go to church. And one of the things in, in our church is that we... We celebrate the Last Supper by taking the Eucharist. And so I take the bread in my hand, and as it's sitting there in my hand, I think, this is the last meal of someone who knew he was condemned to die. This is the last connection with yeah. life. With it was his last meal, yeah. and that's what he chose. And I thought, there's some strong tie there, that, that what's so meaningful to Christians about Christ, our bond to him, is that bread in our hand. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And the one point of intersection with that prisoner is, Cheeseburger, cupcake, Dr. Pepper. Just mundane things. That, we, something? that we can understand. Yeah. Well, Dr. Oslo, so thank ah, you so much. Thank my you pleasure. for coming. A great, uh, 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 Professor Mark Oslo, his, his new book, uh, Jesus on a Death Row, which really a uh, condemnation of our legal system and, uh, and uh, the capital punishment by comparing the trial of Jesus and the capital punishment, uh, punishment of Jesus to what's happening here, especially in Texas. Uh, that will be, uh, the, I'm sure that's uh, a, a huge read. I mean, I read it, you know, a couple of days, it was, it was there. And uh, before, before we leave, and I, I want to, I wanna, maybe we'll have a few minutes here, I want to talk about the International Film Festival. And I know there's 150 different films coming from 62 different countries. I went, I've, been, I've been living there in the last few days. I saw at least seven, eight movies. Uh, the, I, I rec recommend The Foreigner, but one, one movie is... Uh, uh, not an Egyptian, but about Egypt, and it also talks about uh, our topic here, Jesus. But this movie is a documentary uh, happened in, in uh, '69, right after '67 war, where uh, the Egyptians were desperate for good news of the devastation, devastation of '67 war. Uh, so uh, there was a rumor that the, the Virgin Mary appears in one of the church, and thousands, thousands of people march to that church to try to. Uh, see uh, the Virgin Mary, and most of those people were Muslims. They were just desperate for a spiritual, and that is a documentary from a Coptic that he went and talked to the people uh, at the time. It's a beautiful, it's called The Virgin, the Copt, and me. And uh, so go and see it, and we'll uh, see you next week. So I'm alaikum, and God bless you all. Ce soir-là, j'allais fêter Noël chez mes parents, comme tous les ans depuis 37 ans. Mes parents, ils ont quitté l'Égypte en 73, et moi, je suis né à Paris juste après. Mes parents sont coptes. Ils font partie de cette minorité qui ne s'est pas convertie à l'islam quand l'Égypte a été envahie par les Arabes. Quand j'étais petit, ils me répétaient tout le temps que nous, les coptes, on était les vrais Égyptiens, les descendants des pharaons. Du coup, j'étais persuadé d'être le petit-fils de tout Toutankhamon. Ce soir-là, mes parents avaient invité à dîner d'autres amis coptes. Et comme tous les ans, ma mère avait fait dix fois trois à manger. Zohair, une amie de ma mère, était arrivée très excitée. Elle avait apporté avec elle une cassette vidéo. Elle nous a raconté que la Vierge Marie était apparue à Asyut, en Haute-Égypte, qu'elle avait été vue par des milliers de coptes et que cette apparition avait été filmée sur la cassette. Ma mère était un peu sceptique. Elle avait déjà assisté à une apparition de la Vierge au Caire en 68 et elle n'avait pas vu grand-chose. Et moi, franchement, ça fait longtemps que je ne croyais plus à ces histoires. J'aurais bien voulu qu'il y ait quelque chose sur la cassette. Mais franchement, j'étais un peu déçu. Jusqu'au moment où ma mère s'est mise à hurler qu'elle venait de voir la Vierge. Et là, je me suis dit que je tenais un sujet de film.
qui a les, les, les subventions C'est vrai Merci Dieu. Hein? Ah non, non, tu ne me proposes pas un rôle parce que si tu me proposes un rôle, tu dois me payer. Euh, moi, je te propose d'être le trésorière. Gratuitement quand même. Film de Namir, huitième. Oui, Namir, c'est Grégoire. Alors, j'ai eu ton projet. Bon, je peux pas te cacher qu'à la prod, ils sont un peu sceptiques, hein, mais moi, j'ai envie d'y aller, j'ai envie de te produire. Je trouve ça vachement bien. Oui, alors, c'est vrai que ça part un peu dans tous les sens. Est-ce que c'est un film sur les copes Est-ce que c'est un film sur toi Est-ce que c'est un film sur la Vierge euh, Donc, le premier truc à faire, ça va être de te centrer sur un seul sujet. Et puis, s'il te plaît, fais un effort, trouve-moi un titre. 